You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. In 2004, Wang Tao, a young engineering student at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, received a grant of $2,300 U.S. to develop a drone. Two years later, he founded a company called Dajiang Innovations, or DJI, from his dorm room. This year, DJI became a majority stockholder in Hasselblad. Need I say more? Our guests today via Skype are two photographers who have incorporated drones into their photographic work. Miles Morgan is a pilot by trade who has embraced landscape photography with a passion. His work is painterly and he makes no bones about his use of Photoshop in creating his landscapes. Ryan Dyer is making his second appearance on the show. He too has been fortunate enough to find his niche as a working photographer and earns his living doing what he enjoys doing, taking pictures and running workshops on taking pictures. Both Ryan and Miles are from the northwest corner of the lower 48 states, which is arguably one of the prettiest places on the planet. Welcome, gentlemen. Hey, thank hey. you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me again. It's pleasure. Yeah, thanks. It's a pleasure being had, as they say, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, you, you know, this, what I figure is you've really scraped the bottom of the barrel if you have us on. So I'm sorry you ran out of, out of qualified guests. <laughs> and and, and me, me twice. This must be some sort of tax write-off I don't know about. <laughs> well, you know, Photo Plus starts this week, man. So everybody else is busy, you know. So we just we, we <laughs> yeah. took what was left there, you know? <laughs> yeah, smart move. <laughs> anyway, let's just start off. Um, uh, each of you started off as ground-based photographers. And I'd like to know, what made you go airborne? What was the aha moment uh, for each of you and you could fight amongst yourselves about who goes first uh for me it was one a little bit of laziness um you know not not wanting to hike miles and miles and, and thousands of feet in elevation i can just you know do it do it from the ground and that was kind of intriguing at first but it's a new challenge it's something different it's it's a little bit more fast-paced considering the battery life you're you're left to deal with. And it's just a whole new challenge. So that's, that's the thing that keeps me inter, entertained with it. What percentage of your current work is, is uh, a traditional camera versus drone? How would you break it down percentage wise? Of what I'm doing right now, like as of this year and last year, I'd say probably 40% is drone. Oh, wow. wow. Okay. Okay. So it's a new toy. eh? Yeah, it really is. Okay. Uh, and and I've I've broken the toys to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're gonna get to that point. Of oh it. yeah, we, yeah. Have, uh, we have a whole chapter on what that. Was, what was like the learning curve? I mean, did you did you start out with a smaller drone just to learn to fly it first uh, before you started putting expensive cameras on it? Uh, yeah. I mean, I still don't have like a really big drone where, you know, I'm hauling around a, a D800. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it started as small drones, and the learning curve was learning to fly it. Mm -hmm. As as Miles knows, I lost one in the Rockies a few years ago, right in front of him, and I've not lived that one down yet. So, <laughs> lost it in one sense. I mean, smashed into something, or just over a cliff and never saw it again, or over a cliff, never saw it again. Oh, cool. <laughs> but while I'm bragging to a pilot about my flying skills, right? Of course. <laughs> yeah, and, and actually, that's what got me into drone flying. Is is uh, he pulled out his drone for the first time, and I thought, okay, I've been kind of wanting to see this as a pilot. I find it intriguing that you can kind of combine the two things that I do uh, into one thing. So he pulls out his drone and takes off. And within a minute, I, I'm looking at his viewfinder and seeing the perspective change and thinking, holy cow, you can get shots that you simply can't get mm -hmm. on the ground. And and that changes the, the game completely for me. Uh, and then he promptly flew away into Never Never Land, and the drone was gone forever. And I thought, this is awesome. <laughs> anything, anything that costs Ryan $1,000 just to blink is, is my type of thing. <laughs> well, let me ask, did you ever take aerial photos? I mean, you must have. You know, I did a little bit. Um, I, I did a couple of shots uh, from the jump seat of an airplane, uh, I, I, you know, as I was leaving Portland early on when I started, very first started shooting. And those came out exceptionally average, like all my shots. But 
Uh, I've done a couple of helicopter flights, particularly in Iceland, uh, when the volcano was going off there, I did some helicopter, uh, over the top of that. And that was, you know, fantastic. Again, that same thing, the, the looking down perspective, which you don't get, uh, from the ground-based photography. So I had a little bit of experience with that, but, uh, it wasn't anything at all like the drone where you're one, it's a lot cheaper to fly the drone and two, you can be a lot more precise. Mm. Oh, interesting. And, and how so? Well, it's, it's, uh, you know, with the helicopter, you're kind of restricted from getting in too close to things with the drone. You can get, I mean, not mm -hmm. people, but you, if you get right down on a landscape, you can zoom right into something that with a helicopter, it would be unsafe to do right. with a drone. You can kind of cruise around, uh, over the top of a, of a Creek bed, for example, it, you can still fly in the canopy of the trees and move around and get all sorts of different angles. Well, you could do that on a helicopter too. It's just that you can erase chaos in the ground. You try to go, go to rules, a gentle stream <laughs> in, in, a, in a Bell Jet Ranger. It's like it, it's everything. It's going to be like a tornado hit because I've tried it'll, it. I, <laughs> it'll be your last flight. Yeah. 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 And what about the, in the sense of the thought process? Is it, uh, is it similar when you're, let's say, up in a, in a helicopter and you're looking out and you want to decide what you're going to shoot, or is looking at the screen and a drone, does it change things significantly other than the, the safety aspects and, and where you can get your drone into? The, yeah, the thought process is a decent amount different simply because of the uh, technical obstacles that you have shooting out of a helicopter. You have to shoot extremely fast shutter speeds uh, because the, the thing's vibrating, whether you've got your you know vibration reduction on or not, you need to be mm -hmm. up about one five hundredth of a second or faster in the drone. You can get nice and stable if it's not too windy and slow it down to a, a couple seconds. Mm. So it completely changes how you think about what types of shots you can get, uh, depending on what you're flying in or with. I, I would imagine there's another difference also is that when you're, when you're shooting through a handheld camera or on a tripod, you're not only looking through the finder or, or at the screen, but you're also looking around because you're basically there with the camera. Uh, so you could step back, look around and check the, everything out while you're working. You can't do that when you're shooting and everything you see is basically on the screen in front of you because the camera is elsewhere. And uh, is that a little bit disorienting or do you, uh, how do you work with that? I just kind of, uh, I take the same approach as I do, you know, when I, when I'm feet on the ground with a camera where I move around a lot, I'm checking angles and, you know, instead of taking a few steps forward to change my composition, I'm just flying a few feet forward. The, the main difference for me is, is the time constraints. You know, when you're standing there with your camera, you could take a couple hours to fine tune things mm -hmm. with the drone. You're, you've got 25 minutes and then you got to come back and hopefully not miss the, the best light. And I thought about that when we were preparing for the show and that I, I know quite often landscape photographers in particular, you know, it's not unusual to get out where you're going hours before and scout uh, uh, and have everything ready for that moment when everything, when the light happens, hopefully happens because you never know what's going to happen until the, you know, the last moment. You don't yeah. really have that luxury when you're shooting in this. Uh, first of all, you, you've got the time restraints of battery uh, and a lot of other things. You, If it's really windy out, if you're on a good tripod, it doesn't matter where yeah. If you're flying, exactly. it's a whole different set of rules. Uh, one fact, speaking about wind, what's the maximum wind that you could shoot in or have shot in before things just get useless to you? Well, we've done we've done up to, you know, the, the, the drone will fly 25, 30 miles an hour. And we have done some shooting in more than that. And I can, I can tell you that because at full speed, we were still going backwards. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that becomes a bit of a problem when you're trying to recover the drone, <laughs> but it's still shootable. There are pretty amazingly stable platforms, um, that if you're shooting at, you know, not, not super slow shutter speeds, but even in a, a strong wind, you can still shoot. It's just a matter of, can you get the drone back? And also, I oh, guess wow. it's a matter of, of adjusting the uh, acceleration of the drone into the wind and playing off that because it, it's a counterbalance that you're really doing at that point. That's correct. Well, Yes, but the the drone has such incredibly well designed and engineered GPS that even in a strong wind, you can let go of the thing and it's going to mostly hover in place and not drift with the wind. And so that's really beneficial. I mean, you're not constantly trying to fight the wind to keep your your shot stable. Okay, now we're we're, we're using the word drone very generically here. What yes. drones are you guys using currently? 
uh, one that's better than Ryan's. That's my whole goal <laughs> is if Ryan gets a drone, I get one that's slightly better. And then if he gets a new one, then I get one that's slightly better than that. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my goal is to ultimately have Miles end up broke. <laughs> I, 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 I trying to outdo me. Mission accomplished, bro. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 what, what, uh, what, what uh, drones are you are you guys actually using at this time? Uh, I've got the um, the Mavic Pro two now, mm-hmm. and then the Phantom Four Pro. And that Mavic Pro Mavic Pro two is a that's, brand new. That's much, brand right? new. Yeah. That was the most that's recent correct. unit, right? Uh, okay. Yep. And and how do the two how do the two differ? You know they're 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 fairly similar. They both have a twenty megapixel camera, uh, which is why I stepped up to the Mavic Pro two. I used to have the Mavic Pro, and I was you know for me travel's a big thing because I'm I'm my shooting opportunities uh, sometimes will come while I'm flying a, a trip. So I don't want to lug around my big Phantom Four Pro on a four day flying trip, and then you know, have to take it out and around the country. So if I can have a small drone that I can fit in my suitcase, that's really beneficial. But I was finding that the Mavic Pro with 12 megapixels, I was getting spoiled with the Phantom Pro files and and wasn't really enjoying the Mavic Pro. So now with the Mavic Pro 2 coming out, I've got the 20 megapixel files. That being said, I, I kind of feel like the, ha- having played with both of them now, the Phantom 4 Pro is a little bit more stable, and I think the files are a little bit cleaner. Uh, they're a little bit more detailed and a little bit better with the dynamic range when you're trying to process. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. And Ryan? Uh, yeah, I'm still on a Mavic Pro. Mm-hmm. That's kind of my my one I take around the, the world. And then I've got two Phantom 4 Pros that one sits broken and the other is... <laughs> Is the one I take when I'm driving to a location because it's just too hard to fly with the bigger ones. I see. And uh, on the cameras that are on these, can you kind of distinguish what they are? And do they do they label them in relationship to cameras that, you know, regular cameras that we would know? Possible not, otherwise? It, yeah, not really. They're, they're almost more like GoPro cameras. Mm-hmm. But they shoot better still photos than... Than GoPro does. I, I think it's important to mention that the 20 megapixel sensor is the one inch sensor that originally appeared in the Sony uh, RX100. Now appears in a bunch of other cameras right now, and that, that even among still cameras, that's considered just an amazing sensor to use for compact cameras. I actually it, didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, it, it's I essentially hope it's true. like no, putting. It <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it is. <laughs> it's essentially like putting a, a, a Canon 5D Mark II on your drone and flying it around in terms yeah. of quality. Um, it, it, which is incredible when you think about maybe seven, eight years ago, that camera was light years better than anything out there, uh, for the, you know, the amateur or prosumer. Mm-hmm. And now it, here it is a tiny little thing that's flying around on a drone. And the, uh, the features that are available on these cameras are similar to what you will find then on a, a related Hasselblads or even the GoPros. Yeah, yeah, full manual control over them uh, as far as shutter speed, ISO. Mm-hmm. Um, the old Mavics, you don't have aperture control. Uh, but The new one you do, which is a nice yeah. change. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, what do you uh, view? Oh, good. Continue. I'm sorry. I was going to say there's there's cool panorama settings where, you know, it's just kind of a one-click thing and, and, and the camera shoots, you know, large panoramas for you. Mm-hmm. There's also built-in auto bracketing and HDR, things like that. Okay. What are you viewing on when you're flying these days? Uh, iPhone for me. Okay. Same for me. Yep. Okay. Yep. Have you and, tried the uh, goggles? Yeah. <laughs> no, have you tried the <laughs> goggles at all? I have not tried the goggles. Okay. I've tried the goggles. A, a buddy of mine has them, and it l- looks and feels really cool, but it's one of those things I'd, I'd never buy for myself because I, while well, I look pretty cool doing it, I'd also – would- you know, really dumb doing it, and Miles would make fun of me. Exactly. <laughs> That's why he won't buy the goggles because yeah. I would never let him. He'd be filming, you know, something with his drone, and I'd be filming him with the goggles. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, I think you're probably more likely to step off the edge of a cliff if you're wearing goggles rather than holding a phone in your hand. Am I right or wrong Absolutely. about that? Yes. Absolutely. You got to be careful because I'm, I'm assuming you're you're often flying in places that are kind of rugged. Yes. Yeah, and the, the one cool thing about the goggles for me when I tried them was that you can control the direction of the drone and the camera by where you turn your head, mm-hmm. 
which is kind of cool. But again, you know, if you're standing on a cliff at the ocean, yeah, I'm going to go overboard and Miles is going to film me going overboard yeah. and <laughs> go, go, go viral on YouTube. So how, how Let, Let's get something clear, though, because, you know, Ryan talks about how he's on the precipice of disaster when he's shooting and in the brink of all these incredible places. When Ryan is filming with his drone, he is in the car with the heater on. <laughs> yep. That's how he rolls. <laughs> and you know who said... You Tunes know who's on. sitting right next to me? <laughs> who's tuning the radio? Your cat. <laughs> yeah. Your cat. So it sounds like you guys are shooting a lot together out there. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> well, we're actually broadcasting from the company Sauna. I don't know if you know that. but uh, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> yeah, the, 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 <laughs> Well, actually, how do you guys uh, organize your trips? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that you... You're not always shooting together, so whenever one of you is, uh, or Miles, whenever you're flying to a space that's nearby, or do you guys live nearby, or how do you coordinate your trips? Miles, take that one. You're, you, well, you're, the, co- you're the coordinator of the trips, most mostly. Uh, you know, usually we try to find, uh, both of us have pretty busy lives with, you know, family stuff, and uh, so we try hard to, to figure out times that, hey, can you get, uh, you know, a week off? here? Can you get a week off there? And then once we've kind of found a time that we think we can work with, then we start to try to figure out, okay, well, what would be a good place to go during that week for the conditions? So if it's fall color, you know, hey, let's head down to uh, the Eastern Sierras. If it's going to be summer thunderstorms, let's go down to uh, Colorado. If it's, you know, not too terribly weird or hot or cold, let's go down to the desert and so once we've kind of got that organized, then we just get an itinerary based on different areas uh, in those locations that we want to go see. And then the day before the trip, we go, uh, let's scrap those plans and go someplace else. <laughs> <laughs> and has, uh, I mean, have you picked out spots now specifically because you're shooting drones that you might not have otherwise? Yeah, our whole last trip down to uh, Utah was 100% drone. Did we even bring a camera? I, I I brought my we did bring we, your we, camera. We, we brought we the D850s. I we I did. took three files oh, wow. yeah. with my D850. Wow. Yeah, it was it was basically a drone trip. Okay. And you know, Ryan was saying he shoots about forty percent drone. I'm about seventy percent drone now. Wow. In in what's the time span that you've kind of switched over, or I don't want to say switched over, but you know, now that you're incorporating drones, or how long have you been incorporating drones? Probably the last year for me. It's okay. been longer for you, right, Ryan? Right. Yeah, for me it was 2015 uh, on a on a trip to Colorado with Miles and my wife, where I lost the drone. Uh-huh. Um, oh, that so, trip! Yes, we heard that, about it. That, that trip. infamous trip. <laughs> um, so it's you know it wasn't an immediate takeover for me. It wasn't like oh my god, I've I found the new thing for me. It was. It was slowly incorporated, but I've fallen more and more in love with it and the challenges that it brings. So, you know, it's it's really grown on me, and I'd probably shoot a lot more drone stuff. I'd probably be closer to 70% of, of my work being drone stuff if I could travel with my, my Phantom 4 Pro super easily. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. One of the things that I know is we're looking at uh, the photographs you guys have taken uh, on, your, on Instagram and your websites. There are some images that are obviously time exposures. Water is, you know, flowing and it's, it's, it's as if it's, a, it is long exposures. How long can you shoot? With current technology, what's the longest exposure that you would trust to get a sharp image and, say, have moving water? Well, I think the shot that you're referring to is the North Fork shot, and that was a about a second exposure that that I was able, and that was dumb luck because I had a very spastic drone that day. Um, that it just I don't know if it just didn't hook up to the GPS or what, but it was not hovering, so it was in constant motion. Uh, which is exceptionally stressful when you're in a lot of trees. But uh, it it was I, I got one sharp file of the water, and that was at about a second. I think I was trying to go to two seconds um, and didn't get anything that was that was stable. And a lot of that's going to depend on how windy it is. If, if it's calm conditions, you could probably get two seconds out of it with an ND filter. 
but otherwise half second to a second is probably as long as you're going to get lucky to get. Okay. And so you guys are using ND filters on these cameras? Or yes. At times. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, and polarizers. Okay. Yep. So yep. in kind of incorporating what you might call your normal style of photography, but just with a drone. Yeah. yeah the for, end. Go ahead, buddy. That I was going to say for me, the, the drone does not mean I'm shooting differently mm -hmm. necessarily. And, you know, I'm not after a different type of photo all the time. Uh, right. I'm just after a little bit different perspectives. Right. And so, you know, the, the shooting style is, is really the same for me. And can you talk about some of those perspectives or at least what you found to be perspectives that you're enjoying with the drone or what you'd like to get that you haven't yet gotten? You know, you, when you shoot from the ground, you know, a, a lot of the times on the ground, your, your sense of scale is different. Mm -hmm. Your sense of depth is different. You know, you're not seeing the entire landscape when you're on the landscape. And so being up above it, you know, really gives you a sense of, of how big or how detailed or, or, you know, a sense of the, the geology Mm -hmm. around the subject. Is it possible to uh, to know what you want to shoot with your drone before you get, get it up there? Th that's where Google Earth is a really, really useful tool. Interesting, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's great. Now, I was going to ask you if you actually uh, um, go and scope out these places that you're going to using uh, uh, these airborne maps beforehand. It seems to me it'd be silly not to. Yeah, Miles, when, when we went to Utah, you were scouring Google Earth for, for months. Before. Yeah, you, you can get great ideas of bird's eye shots from Google Earth. You can also sort of get a sense of what the landscape might hold that for just more straight on shots. Uh, but you definitely want to... You know, you definitely want to be doing as much scouting as you can, and Google Earth is is critical for that. But even once you get on location, you know, battery life image issues are are significant, and you have about a thirty minute battery. Well, if you're flying to a place that's a mile away, mm -hmm. you're going to use ten percent of your battery getting there, ten percent of your battery getting back. You may only have ten to fifteen minutes on location. Wow. So you're trying to time all this stuff. And so I like to get there just like you do when you're shooting with the ground-based camera. Get there really early and fly. You know, try to find some comps. Um, you know, go out, fly a battery or two, go find some comps, come back, try to recharge your battery, and then when the light's good, then you hopefully have a, a general sense of where you're trying to get to. Although I have found that I am incredibly good at forgetting what I have scouted. <laughs> <laughs> so lying off the how, wrong how direction. How many batteries do you carry with you, and how do you recharge them when you're out on location? We're, we're normally carrying, what, around five each, but then constantly cycling them. So as we fly one, burn that battery, we fly back, put that one on a charger, grab the next one. So it's this constant cycle of flying and recharging and flying and recharging. And what's your charge device? Because I imagine you're not always near an outlet to plug into. What, what are you using as a power source? We're both using these big Goal Zero uh, batteries. The, it's almost like a car battery mm -hmm. type of size, but it's you know got all the, uh, the inverters built into it. Right. Ah, okay. Right. All right. Yeah. And if you're traveling, you can you can charge with a you know a car charger with a cigarette lighter. Yep. I've only got three batteries. Ryan's clearly compensating for something with his five. <laughs> <laughs> well, according to your logic, you have to buy six now. Oh, that's true. <laughs> and I'm just trying to I'm trying to make you go broke. <laughs> you guys totally need your own podcast. <laughs> uh, you definitely definitely. definitely. <laughs> um, let me ask. So it sounds like sometimes you're sending these drones a mile away. Are you? Are you usually not able to see the drone when you're when you're photographing? Well, we would never do that because it's required no. by the FAA to be line of sight. Oh, really? Yep. Okay. All yep. right. Yes. With uh, the with the binoculars that we carry and the scouting pilot, uh -huh. we can see it up to like three miles. I think the farthest we've done is three miles. That's incredible. Ah, okay. Wow. And how high will the drone go? Uh, we're told it'll go sixteen hundred feet, but we would again never do that because four hundred feet is the legal limit. Okay. Yes. E even out I, I, in the open, when you say you're out in the, in the middle of the plains and you're not near a major airport or anything, you still have to f uh, stick to those limitations. That's correct. Okay. That's something I've been wondering about. Is that we're talking about landscape photography and um, comparing it to land-based photography? Drones have wider angle lenses, and uh, as far as I know, you, that's pretty much what they all have. Do you find that uh, a liability, or is it just something that, a, a limitation that you work within? Are there times when you wish you were able to change the focal length of the cameras, of the lenses? Well, now they've got the, the Mavic Pro 
Zoom, uh, which I have not tried yet. And I and we Ryan and I talked about which which one are you going to get because the Zoom does sort of solve that problem. Um, but we end up, I mean, the, the type of shooting that Ryan and I do is almost all wide angle anyway. Uh, and if you need to get into kind of a mid zoom, you can always just fly closer. Uh, you're still, you're not going to get the compression that you do by zooming in with a, with a telephoto lens, but you can, you can work around it because you're mobile. Um, if you're the type of person that likes the more abstracty shots, then you might find that the Mavic Pro Zoom is a better camera for you. But we're we're kind of wide angle dudes, so yeah. Is it safe to assume that with uh, with the zoom, with the longer focal lengths, you're also narrowing uh, your exposure uh, uh, parameters? You can't shoot one second if you're having a longer lens. Um, is that safe to assume? That would be safe to assume. I've not put it to the test because I've, you know, I've only flown the drones with the wide angle lens. But yeah, I mean that that theory would hold true. Yeah, because I'm not sure yeah, if the stabilization systems would, you know, compensate automatically for the longer focal length, whether it's integrated or not. That's why I was asking. I doubt it because I, I'm assuming that the stabilization system is working at max capacity all the time. Yeah. Uh, so I, I doubt that they would have some, you know, hyper setting that that would be effective. Uh, more so than it would with the wider angle lens. I imagine ninety percent of of people buying drones are doing it for video, and and not for serious landscape photography like like Miles and I do. And so those long exposures probably aren't it's the not first an thing. Issue. On, yeah, yeah, the, the, it's it's not a big thing on DJI's mind, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. And what about some of the you know the advanced techniques like focus stacking? perspective blending, things that you guys do with your land-based uh, work. Is that possible at all with the drones? I've, I've never tried to focus stack. I, I don't know how well that would work with the drone. Mm -hmm. um, and really you're not getting close enough to your, to your foreground subjects to really need to focus stack because, you know, th there's, there's so much, you know, propeller wash coming down that if you're getting really close to your, to your foreground, you're blowing things all over and it's not mm, looking great. That's true. Yeah. Um, but as far as you know, exposure blending, things like that, um, I definitely bracket all my exposures with my drone. Hopefully, I, I don't need to blend exposures, but oftentimes I do to, to overcome the dynamic range issues on the, on the cameras on these drones. Yeah, definitely doing uh, you know, a lot of pano shooting as well so that you're, you're stitching yeah. images together, um, particularly in the, in the horizontal, you know, left to right. Uh, but a, a lot of the stuff, you know, the ND, for example, the ND filters that you, that they make for these drones, I'm, I'm not sure if anybody else really uses those for still shots. It just, it's supposed to be because it brings the frame rate down, uh, to make the video cleaner yeah. and it's, it's not really, I don't think it's really designed for uh, still shooting, mm -hmm. but it, I mean, it kind of made sense to me. I thought, well, I, you, shoot, I wonder if you can get kind of the, the dreamy long exposure water shots. And so I gave it a shot and it, it seems to work for that purpose as well, but that's definitely not what it's supposed to be doing or designed yeah. for. Okay. How low a light can you shoot under? I know you could shoot mm -hmm. it dusk, but I mean, how far can you push your limits? Yeah. You, Miles, you pushed it as far as, as either of us have when you shot that skyline the other day. Yeah, I was shooting. I mean, in the, in the dark. I mean, it was definitely a, an evening shot. And they they the Mavic Pro two has a a hyper light setting they call it. And it's uh, I tried that out, which kind of brightens up the scene and gives you sort of for night skies. Um, I found it to be okay, but the uh, basically all it does, from what I could tell, is increase the ISO to sixteen hundred, mm -hmm. and so you end up getting a pretty noisy file. I, I shot uh, basically very, very deep into the blue hour. So I'd say probably 45 minutes before sunrise. Oh, and it was okay. pretty dark. And I was getting, you know, one to two second exposures uh, in order to get any sort of shadow detail. And that's that's tough. It's definitely a hit and miss kind of thing. You'll find that the, the drone stabilization is great. But if you're trying to move and shoot you know, consecutive shots for like a pano, mm -hmm. you're best to get the drone in position let it settle for a good 10 seconds. Don't move a thing and then take the shot because it's kind of doing these micro adjustments, which you wouldn't normally notice. But when you're trying to shoot, 
you know, two or three seconds, it'll, it'll show up as blurry. Now, aside from, uh, your, the creative post, uh, processes that you do, are there, a, uh, compared to land-based shooting and handheld tripod, however you want to term it, um, are there extra steps that you're taking post capture that you would not normally, that you previously didn't bother with, uh, that you have to do now because of the nature of drone shooting? And again, not creative, me, just technical. Yeah, for me, the only thing I make sure to do almost 100% of the time when I'm shooting sunrise, sunset stuff with a drone is bracketing exposures. You know, I'll, I'll bracket, you know, five different exposures just to make sure if I get home and the dynamic range is just not not working out for the shot I'm, I'm trying to process you know, I'll go in and blend exposures. And that's something I've stopped doing, you know, in the past several years with, with, you know, how good the IQ is on modern DSLRs. Mm. What about uh, ISO performances compared to, let's say, a D850? Is it uh, comparable? <laughs> not even, close? The, not they, the they, same they sport. They do not compare. Yeah, no. not at all. Yeah. Not I'm, I'm hesitant to take my Phantom 4 Pro, which arguably is DJI's, you know, best prosumer camera mm -hmm. i'm hesitant to take that to iso 400 500 where yeah. with the you know with the d850 i'm sure. i'm taking iso 3200 shots without yeah. batting an eye interesting a uh, quick question about what you were referring to when you know you want the camera to stabilize itself for 10 seconds does is that kind of fall in line with your land-based photography in the sense that you're shooting about the same amount of frames per shot let's say or, or per image uh per view i don't know what the, the phrase i want to use here but do you get get my sense are you are you shooting more or less given the time constraints of the battery and all that is your process more or less the same when you when you found your angle and your perspective um it's a good question uh, not really with the camera I, I find myself shooting a lot more frequently um with the drone it's what we talked about earlier of getting yourself kind of dialed into a specific shot is really hard to do and you'll find yourself kind of making micro moves quite often and you know trying to fine tune things and and then uh, you know once you finally get on on site you'll take a couple shots and then I find myself moving on to the next perspective whereas it with the camera there are a lot fewer options so once I'm kind of set with a composition I tend to stick with it where the drone I find myself not necessarily for technical reasons, but just for creative reasons, moving around a lot more frequently. Yeah, it must Absolutely. be hard. I mean, there must be, once you're up there and you just, you, you know, a small little turn and you have a whole new view, right? Totally. Yeah. It's infinite yeah. compositions yeah, become yeah. available. Yeah. yeah, I mean, flying a foot higher or lower can absolutely change your entire composition. And what do you think about, you know, going forward, how or how has the shooting with the drones affected your land-based work and, and what you're looking for when, you're, when your tripod's set up? Is there... Is it hard to go back? Do you, have you bought a twelve tripod? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I carry a forty-eight foot tripod. With me. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I don't need the drone anymore. <laughs> but no, but have you seen? I mean, let's say you're out shooting just land-based. Are you thinking, man, I wish I had my drone with me, or you know, now I'm going to do something different that I didn't think to do a couple of years earlier? I mean, I I almost always have my drone on me now. Okay, you no, know, it's yeah, it's just another thing in my bag. Mm -hmm. You know, especially with the the Mavic, and that's why you know I'm ordering the Mavic Pro two is because you know, it's that's the size that you can throw in your bag and have it as a piece of your kit. Right. You know, the 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 Phantom. You know, it's big, it's bulky, it's you know, you're you're carrying your backpack of gear, and then you're also carrying this luggage with you, but uh. You know, with the Mavic, it's just another part of, of kit. And so when you're in a location, as long as drones are allowed to fly there, you know, not in national parks, things like that. It, it, we've joked around about, you know, bending the rules, but I've, you know, I don't fly in national parks. You know, I, I really don't want to give drones a bad name and I don't want to mm -hmm. be that guy to, yeah. to ruin it for everybody. Mm -hmm. But um, can you speak a bit about that then? What are some of the rules that we may or not be uh, familiar with? Obviously, airports, yeah, parks. Yeah, like there's that. all sorts of no fly zones and... There, there's ones that aren't even written rules. You know, it's you could fly around in your, in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I don't fly around in my neighborhood. I yeah. don't want to piss off my neighbors. Sure. I, I, you know, Scared if I dogs. saw a drone flying around my neighborhood, I'd be like, who's the weirdo? Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, well, I can so tell you you're, the, from you're the weirdo. <laughs> yeah. Speaking when when I'm out when I'm out sunbathing, I don't need my neighbor peeking at me. <laughs> Nobody needs Nobody. to peek. <laughs> <laughs> I knew something like that was going to You open yourself for that one. I could tell you from personal experience, uh, about a year and a half ago, my wife went out to Red Rock Canyon outside of Las Vegas, which a place I love. Every time I'm there, that's where I go. And we would just spent the day hiking. And it was a stunning day, and all of a sudden I hear a mosquito. And I'm looking around and saying, damn, that's a drone. And I look up and son of a gun, somebody's flying a phantom up there. And it was really invasive. It was annoying. And I, I, I just found it to be totally just in your face to everybody who went there. Uh, and we actually tracked down, we found it was a family and they were just letting the kids play. And I gave them a piece of my mind about the whole thing. And you know what? They kept flying. They didn't care. And I think that anybody who's listening to this show, do keep that in mind that yes, you can get some great uh, uh, footage in the state parks or national parks. Don't do it. Buy postcards. Okay. Because you're really, you're wrecking everybody else's experience. That's not what it's about. And even yeah. in the places where it, you're allowed to fly, it's yep. perfectly legal. You don't want to be the guy bumming everybody out. That, that gives all drone pilots a bad name. It's going to ruin it for everybody. You know, you have to take moral stock of yourself and say, say these people are out enjoying nature. Do I want to ruin it for them? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't if, – if it's a crowded area, if there's people around enjoying the outdoors – I don't fly the drone. You know, it, yeah. I, I just don't want to annoy people. And so. even if you, if, and again, keep it in mind, if there's, you're saying if there's nobody around, if you're in a rocky area, mountainous area, hill, you don't yeah. know who's on the other side of the hill. I, absolutely. So just don't do it. Yep. Yeah. I've had a couple, th this is probably the, the most important point uh, to, that's being brought up today is, you know, I, I did a wedding, which don't ever do that <laughs> ever. <laughs> I mean, I, I will never do that again, and it was only because it was a friend of mine. But this friend of mine is a pilot, and he asked me to do his wedding because I work cheap, which is free. <laughs> and so I brought my drone, and I'm flying my drone uh, with a group of 50 pilots. It's, it's all pilots at this wedding. And I launched the drone up to take an aerial picture of everybody, and everybody goes, oh, cool, look at that, and they're waving. That lasted for 10 seconds. And then it became annoying to even a group of pilots. Mm -hmm. So if if pilots can't find it to be interesting for more than ten seconds, the average, you know, Joe that's out there just trying to enjoy his day is going to find it extremely annoying. My general rule is the same as Ryan's, which is if there are people around, I just don't fly, whether it's a good shot or not. I just it's I don't want to be that person. And we're pretty careful when we plan our trips to go to the middle of nowhere and and do that kind of flying. And if I am going to fly over somebody or around somebody, I try to do it very, uh, just a quick transit to get away from that area where they are. And if I am, am flying around and I happen to come across somebody, which I've done recently, I accidentally flew over some hot springs and these poor six people were sitting in the hot springs. And I'm thinking, oh, this is, I mean, the, I get out of there as fast as I possibly can just to try to give them some privacy. That's and, creepy. You just, yeah, it was, <laughs> I've got, it's, you know, it's weird this you asked me for that footage a while ago and I, I didn't give it to you. So I don't know why you're, <laughs> well, I, 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 I watch, I watch it while I'm sunbathing. <laughs> yeah. By the way, my work around for weddings, I just put little GoPros on bottle rock. It's three seconds and it's over. <laughs> nice. You know, you get your shot and it's gone. <laughs> gone. Um, <laughs> so then will you often take, you'll generally have both your land-based camera and your drones with you when you go out, will you set them both up and, and be ready for kind of all, uh, all possibilities or do you tend to kind of do one or the other? I just went shooting, um, last week, uh, in, in upstate New York and had the camera, had the drone fully intending to do mostly drone shooting because that's what I mostly do. And I took the drone up and it just didn't, it didn't work. It wasn't, it wasn't the right tool for the environment we, I was in for what we were trying to shoot. So it's not, it's sort of the, it's very location dependent. Some locations are great for the drone. Other ones are just better for the camera and the low kind of cool perspective. And there's a lot of things that you can do with the camera that you can't do with the drone, you know, getting super close to a foreground and making it big and dramatic and, and things like that. Well, I guess that kind of gets me back to a, a question I was, was raising earlier. Do you see any difference in the type of photos you're taking more, more close-ups, more abstracts, anything along those lines that have, has come from the drone shooting? And has it carried over to your land-based? I feel like my style is still the same. Mm -hmm. It's just more of a perspective thing. I, I almost yeah. think of the drone as a, as a different lens. Yeah. You know, it's, I'm, I'm, still after a certain, I'm still after a certain type of imagery. 
this just opens up the options a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, it's you know, another tool it, in your toolbox. It's what it is. Ex- yep. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a, you know, drones have gotten really big, really quick. And, you know, we can scroll through Instagram and see a million shots sure. looking straight down on some trees, which is, yep. you know, that's fine and dandy, but that's not what a drone is for me. Mm-hmm. It's not going to change the the type of imagery I'm, I'm making. It's just going to open up a few more options. And is it, yeah, you'll see, Sorry, you'll no, see the people that are shooting the, you know, if they're the type of folks that shoot a lot of abstracts uh, with their camera, you'll see them shooting a lot of abstracts with the drone. If you see somebody that's, you know, shooting a lot of grand landscapes with the camera, you'll probably see them shooting a lot more grand landscapes with the drone than somebody else might. I'm assuming that if you're working in really cold weather, your batteries are not lasting a half hour. Yeah, the, that's that's absolutely correct. You know, the keeping the the batteries cool, uh, or the, I'm sorry, keeping the batteries warm is a big thing. And the drone will let you know when your batteries are uh, are getting too cold. Are the drones and themselves it, affected by uh, temperatures, or is it just strictly the power supply? For me, it's been the power supply and it's the, the power the, supply. Yeah, yeah. The the drone will say, you know, battery temperature warning. Um, you know. Un, unsafe to fly, and so you'll have to bring it back. Um, otherwise, I mean, Miles, we've flown in snow and rain, and, yep. and mm. you know, the, the the propellers do a pretty good job of blowing really? all that crap away from That's the drone. Incredible. So, wow. Huh. Um, I had a quick question about uh, your work, your your workshops that you do, Aaron. Anyway, do you, do you teach drone photography now, or is that just something you're doing privately? Um, Coincidentally enough, thank you for asking. Mm-hmm. Uh, my buddy, <laughs> my buddy Cody Wilson and I have a workshop we're doing that's pretty much mostly all about drones. It's in the Eastern Sierras, um, beginning of next year, um, and so it's kind of a new thing that we we thought might be cool because you know a lot of people are leading a lot of landscape photography tours and workshops, things like that. I do it. A lot of my colleagues do it, and so we were thinking, you know, drones are getting so big so quick you know this is an opportunity not only to you know make some money i mean it's a business we're we're trying to make money but it's also a way to you know try to teach drone photography in a way where we can show people the rights the wrongs things to avoid you know a lot of the issues we've been talking about mm-hmm. here you know following the rules and it's it's been a little bit of of a logistical headache to get you know permissions to run something like this but you know, going through the the proper protocols to set up a tour for drones, uh, where we're following all the the rules and regulations, um, just that also shows that you know we're we're trying to create morally right. responsible you know drone photographers. Sure, sure. That's a very important what you mentioned. No yeah, doubt. no, no. It's yeah, it, no it, it's got to be done right. And um, yeah. anything that you would. You know, what you're looking forward to trying, anything that you've thought to yourself, wow, I really want to get this type of shot and it's not available to me yet because of either the technology or, or the rules or any locations that you want to get that uh, that you're just hoping you can one day? Um, or perspectives I, I would that say matter. that you know, this, the desert southeast uh, of the U.S. for that, me. That, that would is, be the southwest. That's what I meant. <laughs> I was thinking about that. De- okay. It's, but <laughs> you guys haven't heard of the desert southeast in Georgia? Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, Mississippi. The Mississippi. They call it. They call it the Delta, but it's really just yeah. uh, you know a desert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we call you it guys, the moist uh, desert. I <laughs> get out a little bit more. I'm just saying. But, uh, yes, the desert southwest. That uh, it's referring to. Thanks, thanks, Ryan. You got uh, it, but. Yes, that area to me has got absolutely unlimited potential. And and Ryan and I went down there, uh, I don't know, earlier last year, and we were limited only in the fact that we couldn't get our rental truck deep enough into where we wanted to go, where we had scouted. So that's the kind of thing that I'd like to go back and and really get kind of off the grid with our with our trucks that are uh, much more capable off roaders and get into some of these places that I've never seen shots of. Um, but a lot of that is available with the technology that's there now. It's just a matter of, you know, actually having a, a rig that's capable of getting out there to see it. 
And with the ever increasing restrictions on drones, which I'm totally okay with, I, I know they're annoying. Um, the desert Southwest is just vast and empty and you can get in the middle of nowhere really quick and, you know, fly as much as you want without driving anybody nuts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about overseas? Where have you shot with the drones and, and where would you like to shoot? Um, I, I go to Namibia once a year. I don't bring my drone because they're very strict with drones over there. Um, so it's just not worth it to try, but I've flown all over Norway and, and parts of Iceland with mine. Yeah, I haven't really done much international with mine, uh, just because I haven't done much international since I've started doing drone photography, but I have taken it to Hawaii a couple of times and, and flown off the coast there, uh, which is, which is pretty neat. I was excited to try to get to, uh, to the erupting volcano, which Ryan and I have shot thanks to our friend, uh, Bruce Amori quite a bit with the cameras. Uh, but they really, by the time we sort of got into that process, uh, it's, it, it was completely restricted from, right. from drone access or any, any sort of aircraft within 3000 feet. So you can't, you couldn't get anywhere near it with a drone. And prior to that, it had been in the, you know, the, the flow had been in the national park and there's, I'm not going to go fly in a national park. So I would love to have gotten a little bit of volcano shots with the drone, but it just wasn't legally accessible. So you're talking about increasing in uh, restrictions. Mm -hmm. Um, and do you see that as a process going to, that that's kind of a pattern that's going to continue. You're going to see more restrictions I, and less possibilities. Yeah, I personally think so. You know, I do too. Yep. Yeah. Are these yeah, restrictions due to safety or noise, or is it a combination of the two? I, it's I, a little on. bit of both. And the I fact mean, that there's is, more people doing it. I mean. Yeah. From a from a pilot's perspective, uh, it's no joke. There there have been a few videos that that you know some drone operators have taken yeah. that they fly right over commercial aircraft, and they think it's neat. And I I read some comments online by people that say, "Well, this is wow, what a cool video. This is so cool. I want to try that." And regardless of the fact that it's completely illegal, there are unfortunately people out there that think that that looks cool because they get a neat shot. I have seen, uh, you know, there's a study done of what a drone does to an airplane, and it is not pretty. La just and last was, week on, I think it might have been Petapixel, I believe, where one of those sites, they showed a drone going into an aircraft wing. A Mooney, yep. Yeah, and yeah. And that Mooney's doing 100 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm doing... Three to four hundred when we're down at drone altitudes, depending on you know the the air temperature and stuff. And I, boy, you get one of those into a wing or into an engine or through the cockpit window, game over. And you could kill a whole lot of people real fast. And then it's not quite as funny anymore. No. Um, so that that is the safety aspect, and then the annoyance aspect. It's unless you're flying the drone, you hate it. So yeah. there's going to be more and more communities that are saying, ah, we don't want those anywhere near us. And I, un I completely understand that. That's a real well, good and, point. Yeah. And I, I remember a couple of years ago, Amazon going, hey, our new thing is sure. drone delivery. You know, it, I live here in Seattle where, where Amazon's based and, and it was all over the TV. You know, this is our new thing. We'll deliver by drone to your house. You know, you can get it within minutes. And the FAA came in the next day after they announced that, and they said, no, you're not. You're not doing that. <laughs> Aside from battery life, what would you like to see happening with drone technology that will just make your work better? And the camera better cameras. Yeah. Better cameras. Yeah, cameras. dynamic That's range. It. Yeah. That's it. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you could keep on going with the camera tech, and it's going to be – get it's a little smaller and a little bit better camera tech, a little quieter, it'll be, it'll be perfect. Yeah, I mean, if we can get, you know – a a, a Nikon D850 sensor into one of these things. I mean, I, I may throw my my DSLR out the window. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. it's 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 I coming. Mean, I, I, I wouldn't, mean, but the the Mavic Pro Two is really really close to what I would consider to be today's perfect drone. Yeah, and I mean, the the distance they've come from the first DJI products to this is astonishing. And so I have to figure in the next ten years they they just continue to push the envelope and get better. And is DJI the the only game in town for you guys anyway, or have you seen other companies? Have you worked with other drones? I've I, not personally. Mm -hmm. I haven't either. They're, they're out there for sure. And I, I don't want to disparage them because I haven't tried them, but DJI, if you're a serious photographer is, is kind of it. Mm -hmm. 
And I'd love to see more competition because that makes everybody step their game up. So mm-hmm. if, if we can get these other companies out here to compete with DJI, I think that makes everything better. Yeah, gotcha. Ryan Miles, uh, thanks so much for joining us. It was terrific talking with you and uh, definitely learned a thing or two about drones and where we are these days with them. Where can we find uh, yeah, you guys oh, work? Yeah, your site. Uh, Ryan, you where, if people want to see your like work, think, uh, give us a little wrap, uh, roundup of what's going on. Your sites, your uh, everything. Yeah, RyanDyer.com is the place you go for disappointment. <laughs> um, I, I have mediocre and images, and I, te- I teach people how to create mediocre images. Come on. And, uh, <laughs> that's about it. We know better. Uh-huh. And, and Miles? Uh, it's a very original title, milesmorganphotography.com. Um, and if you want to be one of my four Instagram followers, I think I'm Miles Morgan Photography on Instagram too. That's <laughs> yeah. right. That's by, the, by the way, both sites are really worth visiting. They're really, really good. Yeah. Some wonderful yeah, images. These guys are the there. best. And well, thank you guys. Uh, workshops guys. or kind of professional plugs you want to give? Um, I teach processing on my website, um, instructional videos, things like that. That's kind of my forte. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I lead a few workshops a year, not a lot. Um, I go to uh, Norway and Namibia and we've got the new drone tour coming up early next year. So you can check that out. Okay. All on your uh, side. I led one workshop with Ryan and he never asked me to do another one. So that tells you how good I am. at leading. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are goofing around too much probably. <laughs> and if anybody would like to go sunbathing with you guys, who I wish. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yep. Catch us in in Austin next fall. All Austin. right. Yep. <laughs> All right. So goes another show. For now, on behalf of Ryan, Miles, Wang Tao, Jason, John, and myself, thank you so much for tuning in today.